I just would like you to stand up because I want to read a verse and, and crack open the Bible today um, along the lines of what we've been covering the last couple of weeks. And anytime we read the word, we should, we should honor it. Amen? So we're just going to read one verse from Isaiah chapter 21. Can you see it there? Verse 5, it says, rise up. Let's say it together. Rise up, captains. Oil your shields for battle, for your enemy is at the gates. And I just designate everybody here a captain right now in the army of the Lord. And I speak by faith that our shields are oiled for battle. And the enemy at the gates is, is challenging but will not win. The enemy at the gates is already defeated because we walk out the truth that you've given us, Lord, today. Help us to understand the power of the shield of faith that Paul talked about, the, the shield of faith that would cover us and that we would understand the spiritual warfare dynamics. Open our eyes. Open our eyes, not in a spooky, crazy, weird way, but just to understand the way the kingdom operates in the earth. The kingdom of darkness is offset and conquered by the kingdom of light. We are in that kingdom. You've taken us out of darkness and brought us into your marvelous light. And we will declare the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. In Jesus' name, amen. So it's called Rise Up Captains, but it's also tied into Ephesians 6.16 where Paul talks about the shield of faith. And just a quick review, two weeks ago on the 15th, I spoke from Ephesians 5, verse 8, says you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And that was the picture that I got from the Lord was, it wasn't that Peter once was in darkness, Peter once was darkness, right? And now is not only in the light, but is light. And I want to shine as brightly as possible. I hope you do too, amen? And then the other piece was this aim higher, which has been something that I've been hearing in my spirit for a long time, because I, I talk to people, and we just talked about it the last time in the men's ministry, that how do you maintain your zeal for the Lord? How do you keep from plateauing and cooling off? We go through these seasons where, where we're hot for the Lord, and then we cool off. So one of the ways we need each other is to help each other aim higher, because no matter where you are right now in the Lord, you can go deeper into him. And that's an amazing thing, isn't it? There's, there's no bottom to how deep you can go into the Lord. But, but when I say aim higher, it means look for the standard of Christ in everything that you do. Compare yourself not to other people, but to Jesus. And how, how much closer are you to be like him today than you were yesterday? And then every day thereafter for the rest of our lives, we're going to keep trying. And then I just remind, it reminded me that in, in Matthew chapter 7, when it says, ask, seek, and knock, that the way it's written is keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. And that's why we need each other, right? I mean, there's times when Jesus would just take a couple of selected disciples with him to go on a mission. Remember this in scripture? It's not that the other people weren't ready or, or, or important people, but he knew who the special forces were that were going with him. And it, does anybody want to be special forces? Because I think every Christian should have that as a goal. Right? We don't want to be average. There's nothing average about Jesus. There's nothing mediocre. There's, there's no C grade for Jesus. It's A plus, right? And that doesn't mean perform and strive. It means to do what we heard today at the altar is find your true identity in him and stop trying to imitate yourself off of somebody else's picture of who they want you to be. Don't put on Saul's armor. Take your slingshot if you're David, right? Have confidence in who God made you to be, and that's one of the greatest ways that we can help each other. We might see something in you that you don't even see in yourself. And I know we already prayed about church hurt. <laughs> that's one of those topics that's kind of tough, right? Maybe somebody thought they saw something in you, but it, it turned out to be Saul's armor. Well, look, here we are all, all are now, and we could be fixated with looking in the rearview mirror of all the bad things that happen, or we can look through the windshield. What's your choice? I try to make the questions easy in the beginning here. <laughs> I want to look through the windshield. I can't do anything about yesterday. That's gone. I'm looking through the windshield. I'm going to keep trying to grow. And, and that, again, like just be teachable. You have people around you that love you, that know the word, that, that want us. If every one of you are fulfilling the full destiny God has for you, we flourish as a church. And to the degree that we're not, then there's, a, there's room for improvement, right? Not works.
Christ-likeness, discipleship. And often discipleship is letting go of things. But keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. And then last week, I talked about Ephesians 6, and I talked about the sword of the Spirit, which is rhema, which means spoken word. And I know many of us, when we, when we, when we read Ephesians 6, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, it's powerful. It ties into that to the verse in Hebrew that the word of God is alive and powerful, piercing right down to the division of soul and spirit, bone and marrow, right? Know what I'm talking about? So it's true that when we read the Bible, that happens, but it's also true that when we speak it, speak scripture, but also speak the word of God, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. What is your preceding word for today? This is what I heard my wife ask me all the time. I thought I wanted to do something. She said, well, what did God say? I'm like, well, I didn't ask him. And she's like, I thought I married a Christian. <laughs> Love you. I'm really grateful. No, I mean this. It's not like a joke. Like, there's not one decision that he doesn't want to be part of in your life. And, and as you, Lee, we were talking last night at an event and you know, the music that, that the kids are getting into their spirit at, at a young age, they're building such a foundation block in their spirit that that's helping drive their decisions later. And they may not even know it, but by placing scripture next to songs, kids learn so easily that way. Good and bad. Christian songs, yes, but the world too. So if you don't give them a substitute to what the world's going to offer, they're going to be making bad decisions based on, on that playlist. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the rhema, the spoken word of God. So we called it the authority of God's spoken word. And I used a couple of examples that I heard Dutch Sheets use about this. When, when he spoke to the storm, he didn't just think in his head. He spoke to the storm and said, peace be still. That was the word proceeding out of his mouth. When he cursed the tree, he didn't just think it in his head. And it wasn't because the storm could hear it or the tree had ears. It's the authority comes when you speak it. So now today we're going to talk about another weapon, but think about what Paul said. Pray for me, he was talking to the Ephesians, pray for me that I might fearlessly proclaim the gospel. Right? But, but here's the thing. When you have the Holy Spirit in you and you know you heard the word of the Lord, that gives you courage. Fear would do what? Maybe we should run away. <laughs> That's one arrow going this way, but the fearless is what I'm going to call today a paradigm shift. And I know many of you are familiar with that term. It's, it's taking an old way of thinking that kind of cemented in us and shaking that thing up and saying, no, I have to shift to a new thing. I need, I need the breaker to come in. And we used to say stinking thinking, right? Get rid of that stinking thinking so that I'm lining up with the truth of the word, but also the oil of the Holy Spirit to massage that spirit and in truth. The Father's seeking those who will worship him and in truth, right? So not just the letter of the law, because we know that by itself can kill religious spirit. Legalism can kill you. The spirit of God oils up the word of God, and now we're operating in this dynamic so we know how to make the decisions that we have to make. And, you know, most of us that are working a day job are probably not in a Christian community. Fair enough? So, you know, they don't think like we do. They don't talk like we do. But we're there for a reason. And we commissioned people to be in the marketplace. That's as much of a role as somebody who's singing on the worship team or preaching from the pulpit. You're a marketplace minister. And, or you're home. You're at home. And so many more people are homeschooling their children now. Because we can't trust what they're being taught in, in the public schools. Who would have thought? Paradigm shift. And that's the picture of us walking into something, moving forward. When Peter wanted to come out of the boat, he had to take a step of faith. Often faith requires us to move because we can think about it, but action is required. And inaction can be a decision too. And it might be a bad decision. It might be a good one. You just don't know. We're, we're supposed to live in this dynamic relationship with the Lord, knowing his word and listening for his spirit to direct us, surrounded by people who love God too, who we can talk to, and the iron can sharpen iron with each other. And, you know, a, a lot of us don't need to be reminded of how bad COVID was as it relates to isolating us from each other. Forsake not the assembling together with the other believers. So today I'm using a verse from Isaiah as my text, which says, oil your shields 
captains. Oil your shield for battle, for your enemy is at the gates. Okay? But this is where Paul talks about the shield in Ephesians 6.16. He says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. <laughs> right? I don't know, like, there's a lot of fiery darts getting fl flung at us, don't you think? Corporate America, there's all kinds of games being played. And, you know, we like to, to reference the verse in Proverbs that says, if you don't rule your spirit, you're like a city with the walls broken down. And if you show up in corporate America and your walls are down, they're going to say something to bait you, like a lure, a fishing lure. And John Bevere wrote the book, The Bait of Satan, right? Don't take the bait. Don't get offended. Stay in, con in communion with the Lord and say, how do you want me to respond to what was just said? I feel like they're trying to bait me. And don't take the bait. Keep your peace. He's the prince of peace. Let him be on the throne of your heart. All right? So that was, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That's a word of faith right there, isn't it? So I just want to back up before I dive deeper into the shield of faith and just think about what the paradigm shift was for the early disciples and the early church, okay? In 1 Corinthians 4, you know, Corinth was a big major port city, lots of sin. When you read 1 Corinthians, he's addressing a lot of that sin. In other places, it was a different model of a problem. Like in Jerusalem, it was more of a religious spirit because they already thought they knew and he didn't come in a way they expected. But in Corinth, it's like what we have in New York City. Sin City, the big apple, right? Adam and Eve, the apple, take a bite of the apple. No, we're Christians. We could go in there. The sin in New York isn't going to override the peace of God in my heart. The word that we have, greater is he in us than that sin. All right, so he says, let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And then similarly, in Matthew 13, the disciples came and said, why do you speak to them in parables? And Jesus said, because it's been given to you. Can you say it's been given to me? Are you, if you're his disciple, it's been given to me, come on, to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. I'm going to interchange that with kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven being the same thing. That there is a kingdom he wants us operating in here in the earth. Not just when we die and, and go, to, go to heaven. If you're a Christian, that's the assurance that you have. That's where you're going. Right? So... I, this might be very familiar to you, but to a lot of people, they just think it's about when you die and go to heaven. The reason you get saved is an insurance policy to keep you out of hell. That is, that's aiming way too low. You can live an abundant life right now. The thief is the one that steals, kills, and destroys. But Jesus said, I came to give you an abundant life. And, and when your children come to know the Lord, that's abundance. When you see your children walking in truth, that's what John said, I have no greater joy than to know my children are walking in the truth. And if they're not walking in the truth, that could be a great sorrow, couldn't it? But nothing will stop us from praying them in from that pigsty. We're calling them back home. Jesus said, I'm giving you the ability to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but not it hasn't been given to them. We can go into that later. This is now after John. This is Mark 1. And if you, I really like the, the gospel of Mark because he just kind of gets right to the point. It's a quick hitting book. There's only 16 chapters as opposed to some of the other gospels that are longer. They're all good, but Mark just kind of gets to the point. And right in the first chapter, he's bringing up this idea of the gospel of the kingdom of God. It says, after John was put in prison, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Peter Wagner was a good friend of ours. He was a mentor of ours, along with a bunch of other people in that sphere of influence. And when he was like 80 years old, or I don't remember, late, late maybe mid-70s, he had already written probably 65 books at that point. He was a professor of theology and missiology, which means church growth, at Fuller Theological Seminary. And somebody asked him, can you recommend a book on the gospel of the kingdom? And he said at the time, I've never even heard a sermon on the gospel of the kingdom. And he was very well acquainted with the body of Christ in America, but even around the world, because most of us, when we hear the words the gospel, we think of salvation, which is great. The good news of the gospel, that you can be saved from your sin. That's awesome. But what about the empowering aspect of living in the kingdom of God in the earth? They've missed that. 
and it could be a bit of a defeatist mindset. Why bother? We don't have to vote. It's all going to burn anyway. Let's just wait for Jesus to come and take us out of here. Well, the Bible says, occupy until I come. The kingdom of God suffers violence, and the violent ignore it because they're afraid. <laughs> Say it, John. The violent will take it by force. That's it. Well, I thought Christians were loving. Hey, you know, if, if, some, if you know somebody who's caught up in sex trafficking, is it loving to go in and rescue them? You think there's not going to be a little violence involved in that? But that's where you get the strategy. That's where you know. And that's what this whole book is about, is, is acting on the love of God. Sometimes it's uncomfortable, but if you love the person, you're going to do whatever it takes. I just got to say, I saw Christine, and Sammy's doing better. Those of you that have been praying for Sam Tobito. That was some intense prayer. He's home. Hallelujah. So all is well. Preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. This is Mark chapter 1. He wasn't confused. Mark understood that Jesus came preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, if you think that meant the end of the world, what are we doing here 2,000 years later? Clearly didn't mean that. He was letting us know that there's a way to live this life outside of God's kingdom, and there's only other, one other choice. That's darkness, the kingdom of darkness, or inside God's kingdom. I'd rather have that one, but you can't get into his kingdom unless you're born again. This is right out of the Gospel of John. Unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom. And then he says later, he cannot enter into the kingdom. So you can't enter it if you don't see it. And that's another one of these mysteries. Because in America, the culture would make it look like you're weak to be a Christian. Until a football player dies on the field. <laughs> and then everybody's praying. And nobody cares about being politically correct. And they're all wearing his number three. Amazing. Right? People know how desperate it is to not have any hope in anything. You're just a cell that crawled out of the ocean. And when this life's over, forget it. So might as well just eat, drink, and party now. Jesus has a better way. Ooh, such a better way. He was preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. Now, kingdom for us is a little difficult. Maybe if you grew up in England where they have a king and a queen, but we don't. We're a democracy, so we don't always understand the power that the king had. But you remember how scared Esther was? It's like, if he doesn't lift this scepter to me, I'm cooked. I'm done. Hope he's in a good mood. But then she said, maybe, who knows, maybe I'm here for such a time as this. Church, we are here for such a time as this. Because it's ugly out there. Things that we would have not thought we were going to have to try to defend, like marriage between a man and a woman, or the definition of a man, or the definition of a woman that a Supreme Court justice can't answer that. You couldn't make it up. Nobody's that creative. But in the middle of the confusion, he takes the crooked thing and he makes it straight. That's what we're here for. That's part of the ambassador. No, you're confused about something. Let me tell you the truth. I you know if you make comments online, and it can get a little ugly, but they'll tell you, well, you, you call the truth, and they'll put it in quotes. But that's a contradiction. If it's the truth, you can't, you can't debate it, right? Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come into a relationship with my father unless he comes through me. You could be in relationship with other gods, but not my father. You want to get to the father, you come through the son. So the only way, if he hadn't done what we did in communion this morning, if he hadn't offered his life as the perfect sacrifice, we wouldn't have had access. But then he brought his blood and he put it on the mercy seat in heaven. Woo! And the Holy Spirit is released. On all flesh, by the way. All flesh. So when you're witnessing the people, there's a, there's a remnant in there. And that's why you just pray for that right word to say, and he'll tell you. So in, in the Gospel of Mark, it says, repent and believe in the gospel. But he just got done saying Jesus was preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So repent and believe the gospel of the kingdom is very much implied. And the gospel of the kingdom means I have to be an active member of this community. 
I have a new passport. I'm a citizen of heaven, but I'm still in the earth. <laughs> and I have a down payment, the Holy Spirit. In part, I could sense what the future will be like, uh, but it's not in fullness yet, but it's in part. And I can operate on that for the rest of my life. I want to get to know Holy Spirit more and more and more. Because only good things can happen when that happens. Now, there was a man. This is only verse 24 in the first chapter of Mark, okay? He's not worried about hurting somebody's feeling and kind of easing them into this nice little pretty Christian thing. He says, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, let us alone. This is a man saying, let us alone. All right, well, that's not what you normally hear. You might hear it in this church. Actually, I hope you do. <laughs> because if somebody's getting delivered at the altar, let me tell you, that's the no step program. Forget 12 steps. Jesus can just deliver you with no steps. The presence of God can cast that thing out. But the other conviction is somebody be a sinner and be in here and be under the anointing and not get convicted. <laughs> maybe, maybe we need to press in more. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this kind only comes out by prayer and fasting. I want, I want a different translation. <laughs> and then th these unclean spirits said, let us alone, Jesus. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? Yes. 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. As the Father sent me, I'm sending you, Todd. That's your assignment. Destroy the works of the enemy with the love of God, not with a weapon. You don't have to get violent. I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, be quiet and come out of him. So seven words. It's a big, long prayer of Jesus. Be quiet. Come out. He didn't have to go very long. He didn't have to scream. Got authority. Authority of the spoken word. Rhema, that's the right word at the right time. That's the sword of the Spirit. Cuts right through because it's him speaking through you. Open your mouth, he said, and I will fill it. Let's trust him to do that. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. And they were all amazed. That's what happens in a paradigm shift. They were all amazed. It's like, what the heck is going on here? Even the apostles, when they were in the boat and he spoke to the storm, they said, who is this guy? We got in the boat with God. Verse 27 in Mark chapter 1, they questioned among themselves, what is this? What new doctrine is this? It's called the gospel of God's kingdom rule in the earth. <laughs> That's what this is. All right? Wow. Wow. He said, you and I will do greater things than he, than he did. And you could think, well, that's kind of prideful, isn't it? No, we're just reading the book. But what about stepping out in faith? You know, John Wimber used to say he, he would not be at the end of a, of a diving board and there would be an empty pool. And he said, God, fill the pool and then I'll jump. And God said, no, jump and I'll fill the pool on your way down. <laughs> that's faith. Woo! Step of faith, man. Peter walked out of that boat onto the water. That took a lot of faith. Try not to criticize Peter, because when you get to heaven and you say you denied him three times, he goes, yeah, but I walked on water. How about you? <laughs> I said, silver and gold have I not, but what I do have I give to you. Rise and be healed. Pretty good. We're not going to compare in heaven, I promise. <laughs> For with authority, this man Jesus, he has authority and he commands even unclean spirits and they obey him. They don't have a choice. And then this is another important part of spiritual warfare, which this whole topic is really about. When Paul says, put on the full armor of God, it's spiritual warfare. We're not wrestling against flesh and blood. But look at how it's worded here in Luke 4. When the devil had finished tempting Jesus, he left him until the next opportunity came. And this is what's so daily about our lives and why we need each other and why we pray with each other and we get on the phone, do micro groups, and we hold each other accountable and say, look, are you being tempted to look at pornography? Then we want to pray for you. We want to help you. Instead of calling up that 800 number, call me. 
And I'll pray with you on the other end of the phone. We'll, we'll go through it. It's not shaming. Unfortunately, though, in some places, it could feel like, well, I'm a leader, and if I admit that I'm doing something, that makes me look weak, so I'll just stuff it. Wait a minute. The Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. He wants you to speak the truth. And you're not going to be shamed. You might have to take a break from, take, from doing ministry, but that's a great thing to just dig down and find, find the root of the problem. And then, then you come back resurrected, a new person who got delivered. I've been delivered. How about you? I think you should get a little louder than that. <laughs> If you were really happy and you really have been delivered, boy, you want to start stomping around or running around the room. Because the things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Place I used to go, I don't go there anymore. Things I used to drink. <laughs> Hallelujah. So real quick, this is just a, a New Jersey fast-talking version of Ephesians 5. Because sometimes you, you read the chapters separately, but I really think we can make a case that 5 and 6 don't really have to be divided because it's one letter to the Ephesians from Paul and he's got a very strong mission you could see it when you lay it out this way in chapter 5 he says be imitators of God as dear children he's writing to a city that was full of, a, of idolatry to the to the goddess Diana right we know this from the book of Acts Ephesus big church eventually run by Timothy right I think that I think I got that right Timothy would know <laughs> Be imitators. So this is just the good advice he's given us. As you think about the paradigm shift, you're living in New York City in a really rough area with a lot of sin, but you are now a child of God. So you have a different set of rules that you're going to live by, and you need to be aware that you're not wrestling against the people around you. This is one of the mysteries of the kingdom of God that I'm going to reveal to you that it's not that person, it's the spirit that's in that person. And if that person gets saved, their spirit will completely shift. Look at all the people in this room. I know that's true. For all of us that got saved, something happened. We had a guy named Jim McCord here who was one of the roughest, toughest Marine guys who worked as a longshoreman in New York. And when he started to cry, he was making up for decades of lost time before he got saved. And he used to give a testimony and he would have to stop because he was just so grateful. Oh, man. Soften us up, Lord. Be imitators of God as dear children. Walk in love. Flee fornication and covetousness. Nobody said that to the Ephesians. Flee fornication. That was a common thing in the Roman Empire or the Greek culture. And don't let cursing come out of your mouth. What? How hard did that be to stop doing that? I don't even know I'm doing it. Like Not me, but when I first got saved, I didn't even realize I was doing it. You become so accustomed to it. It's like another word. Like, what, what are you talking about? Well, you're dropping F-bombs. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Be wary of pretentious, legalistic, religious spirits. Oh, we could spend a whole day on that one. You were darkness. That was the text verse. You were darkness, and now you are light. That helps me so much to see that. I'm not just in light. I am light. Shining for him. This is the Bible. Don't be drunk with wine. Be filled with the Spirit. And liquor stores have the sign up front. Unlimited spirits. Spirits unlimited? No thanks. No. I want this spirit. Be kind and help each other. What? It's dog eat dog. Don't you know? I live in the real world, not this Christian bubble. Eat or be eaten. Well, that's all you've ever done. You don't even know if there's another way to do it. Try something different. Aim higher. Maybe there's another way, because there is. Live with an attitude of gratitude. Submit to one another out of respect to the Father, our common Father. Now, he's spe specifically speaking to husbands and wives as we're about to go into the end of chapter 5. But we submit to one another out of respect for Christ. If we have a disagreement, it doesn't have to be a screaming match. We get an elder. We try to referee whatever the problem is. If there's still a problem, we take it up. Right? That's what, Je that's what Jesus said to do. Don't, don't treat them as if you never want to see them again. Try to reconcile. Most of the time, it's a misunderstanding. It's not a huge thing, but it can get out of hand, can it? So then it gets uh, to wives, submit to your husbands. We'll just end the service now because that's all he said about this, right? No. No. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. 
So you start loving her, she'll respect you. I'm not sleeping on the couch tonight, man. No. Children, obey your parents. See, like, look, like, why would somebody have to say that? Well, they lived in a culture where they didn't. Honor your mother and father so life goes well. Like, what? First commandment with a promise. There's no difference between five and six. He's just still giving them advice about it. And then he goes ahead a little bit. Fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. That never happens. Father issues in our culture? Horrible, right? Servants, obey your leaders. Now, some versions say slaves, obey your masters. That's a hot button, isn't it? Huh. Leaders, respect those under your authority. Remember, you have no special privileges with God. Similar to what Peter said, right? I, I perceive that you're no respecter of persons, God. You'd even use someone like me. You'd even witness, have me witness to a Roman centurion, the epitome of the enemy. And this guy's a God lover, my cousin Cornelius. He was of the Italian band, right? <laughs> I'm sure we're related. You have no special privileges with God. And I like the way it says it in the voice. Masters, hear this. Act in kind towards your slave. The way you want to be treated, treat them. Stop terrorizing and threatening them. <laughs> it's not that God was approving slavery. It was, a, it was a cultural thing around the world. That's why Genghis Khan con kept conquering countries. Because he got to keep all the people that he captured as slaves. It's horrible. Without a Christian in England, it doesn't end in England first and then end here in the United States. Not long after, William Wilberforce, read the book. It's an unbelievable book about how one man made it his commitment to stop slavery in England. I'm not defending it. Slavery is horrendous. How about abortion? Is that horrendous? It's legal in America. Right? So there's always going to be pagan people doing pagan things. Hallelujah that it stopped, but don't underestimate the point of Christianity was to end it. That's how it did end. Another day's topic. Don't forget that you have a master in heaven who does not take sides or pick favorites. Finally, brothers and sisters, this is uh, Ephesians 6.10. Draw your strength and might from God. Put on the full armor of God to protect yourselves from the devil and, and his evil schemes. And we'll get people that come and visit, and they say, can you recommend a church that's a little less stimulating? <laughs> like, do you really have to yell into the microphone and blow shofars and play the music so long? Like, what's wrong with you people? <laughs> We're grateful. We're grateful that we got saved. Who the sun sets free is free indeed. Come at 11 if you don't want worship. Come at 11. It's like a platter, you know, at a Chinese buffet. Take what you want. There's people here at 9 o'clock praying. I mean, it just sets the table, doesn't it? It's so beautiful. So put on the full armor. Well, I thought God was love. Why do you have to talk about all this warfare? He's just love. Well, because we, if we don't understand that, Pagan people take over the culture, and our kids get indoctrinated with lies. So it's a failure. It's negligence. It's, if we had a license, we would be sued for negligence. Right? Why didn't you get involved and, and run for the school board? How can you complain if you weren't willing to invest any time and try to change it? This is what he's saying to me. Okay? Let, let it begin in the pulpit. Judgment begins in the house of the Lord. So we are taking steps to help people get more involved. Yeah. I'm old enough not to care anymore. I don't have to be politically correct about all this stuff. And it never was supposed to be that way anyway. So we keep going. We're not waging war against enemies of flesh and blood alone. No, this fight is against tyrants. Pimps. Authorities, 
supernatural powers, not against demon princes, that's, I'm sorry, it is against demon princes that slither in the darkness of this world and against the wicked spiritual armies that lurk about in heavenly places. Man, that's some language right there. That's a voice translation. That really helps us understand that, that we're in a war. Whether you like it or not, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, a war started. When Jesus came, he took major territory back because he made the kingdom available to us now. If we choose not to enter it, don't complain. You've got to help people get born again so they can enter into the kingdom and then get empowered by the Holy Spirit because it's not by might. It's not by power. God said, it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Well, if you're not saved, then you're not getting the full unction of the spirit. So getting somebody saved could be one of the greatest things that ever happens to them. Everybody needs the Lord. So this just sounds like demon princes slithering in the darkness of this world against wicked spiritual armies that lurk about in heavenly places. Does that sound like America in 2023? Sadly, yes. And we're not blaming them. We should blame the church for not being more vigilant about this whole thing. It's never too late. Look through the windshield. We can start now. That's how you have to look at it. So then he says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked one. Uh, don't you love that? Now, some people, when they read it, say, above all means it's the most important one of the gifts. But I would recommend that you get a book called Dress to Kill by Rick Renner. He talks about the armor of God, Dress to Kill. You get it? You're not cold, are you? <laughs> I would offer you my fan, but you're already too cold. <laughs> Above all, taking the shield of faith. So instead of thinking he meant it's the most important thing, it meant it was covering you. Above all, like a banner that covers you. It's protecting you. That's what a shield does. A shield protects you. And Rick Renner uh, has some amazing commentary on this. So here's a quote from him. A better translation for above all would be out front, covering all. It doesn't describe the importance of faith. It describes the position of faith. It's helpful. The Greek word for faith here is pistis, which usually describes something, this is so good, right, that's moving forward. So Peter's in the boat. In order to exercise his faith, he has to take a step. And that's why we say, take a step of faith. That it's really very much implied in everything moving forward. It's like a bullet that's been shot out of a gun. Bam! You can't pull it back. Faith is something that propels forward. Scripture describes a fast forward advancing force. Thank you, John. Romans 12, 3. God has given to every man and woman the measure of faith. So one of the things Rick Renner talks about is how they would, the Romans would measure the shield for each soldier got a customized shield. Because if you're six foot four versus five foot ten, it matters. You want a custom made shield. And that's what he's that's the point he's making here. People would say to him, I just don't have as much faith as you, Rick. I must have a deficiency in my faith. He said, No, that's not true. God has given everyone the measure of faith, the measure, like you were being measured for a suit. When you were born again, God measured you from top to bottom and side to side. He gave you enough faith to cover you. <laughs> yeah, you should just invite Rick Renner to come here from Russia and pre. <laughs> well, the last few decades, all right, you know, I'm just going to take a, a little bit of a, a pause here for a minute. And, and I, I'm just going to tell you right up front, this lady's not a Christian. She's, uh, she's Jewish. She's uh, a person of faith. Her name's Abigail Schreier. She's a writer, and she's brave. She takes on people that don't want you to hear what's really going on in America. She wrote a book called Irre Irreversible Damage about the movement of people, young girls having their breasts removed and not needing parental, in, parental uh, consent. 15 years old in Oregon, the, rule, the law says that a girl could just go. The doctor's not allowed to, to make any... Uh, do an, do an assessment of her and recommend it. The doctor has to just agree to it. If she's 15 and she thinks she should have her breasts removed because she's really a, a boy, they can't say anything. They just have to perform the operation. If you have kids, there should be a righteous indignation rising up on the inside of you because there's a sacred role between parents and children. Right? It's godly. Your life changes when you have a child. You, you recognize, oh, man, 
The Beatles, if you're old enough to remember, they said, boy, you're going to carry that weight a long time. <laughs> but as a Christian, you're like, no, this is the greatest privilege there is. We have the chance to create another human being in God's image. And when we dedicate babies, we're talking to the church and saying, are you going to help this couple right there? We just said it a couple of weeks ago. Or are we going to help them raise up the children? Yes, that's why we have children's ministry. That's why we're teaching them the word at a young age. So they'll have the equipping that they need to fight this. This doesn't go away. But just so you know, in California right now, this is a specific instance. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying, open your eyes. Recognize what's happening around us. Be like the sons of Issachar. They knew the times and seasons, and they knew what Israel should do. Not put our head in the sand like an ostrich. While the last few decades have seen an increase in human trafficking in California, women at all three of these anti-trafficking groups that she spoke with across California agreed that nothing compares with the stunning rise in human trafficking that they have witnessed in recent months. One of the main ir ironies here to me is that people who believe this is a good thing call themselves progressives. Like, our policies are actually increasing human tra trafficking. Isn't that progress? If you're a predator, that's what the title of the article is, A Predator's Paradise. So there's this high-level scheme to pass laws that on the surface don't look like they're having much of a difference. But in this particular case, the law was passed that a prostitute can't, can't be approached by a police officer for loitering. The only way the police officer could, could get involved is if she hears him soliciting the person that she's talking to. Okay? So they can't do that. I'll just keep going here. <laughs> He's talking to this woman named Powell. Uh, her last name is Powell, who was formerly a, a sergeant for the Los Angeles Police Vice Division. Knows the city streets. This lady knows the city streets intimately. She was a sergeant. Over the last six months, this woman says, the number of prostitutes has doubled. This is since that law was passed that the police can't stop anybody for loitering. Meanwhile, Abigail Schreier is saying, it's not hard to see that the prostitutes, they're wearing bikinis at night, walking on, on the street. Like, this should break our hearts. Because when you link that with the fact that they're now a sanctuary state and willing to help runaways come, we'll pay for you. If your parents are so old-fashioned that they don't recognize that you need help, they don't recognize who you really are, you can come here. We'll pay for you to come to California and be a sanctuary state. Well, sanctuary means safe. Human trafficking is not safe. You've got to be careful when you talk about this. It doesn't mean there's not a point that people do need compassion. If they're confused about their sexuality, in no way should we ever come across as, as not feeling empathy for that. But the whole culture, what did you think when you were 14? What did you think when you were 15? When I was 14, I got a pimple, and I thought I was going to have it the rest of my life. Did you? Like, you don't know. Like, oh, my God, I have a growth on my face. <laughs> changes, doesn't it? You're going through all kinds of hormonal changes and things that you might think at 13 or 14, you would look back on and say, oh, my God, I'm so glad they didn't let me make a decision. We're promoting that now. They can't go serve in the, in the military. They can't vote, but they can have body parts removed without parental permission. Are you kidding me? We got to wake up. Sorry, this is not okay. All right, I'm almost done. Thank you. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning. Rise up, captains. All your shields for battle, for your enemy is at the gate. And then this is really a sobering one for me. This is another place where it's referenced. O oh, mountains of Gilboa, may you have no dew or rain, no fields yielding offerings of grain. For there, there the shield of the mighty was defiled, the shield of Saul no longer anointed with oil. So I told you, anoint your shield with oil is the title, but we're really going to get into what that means. Now we are going to get into what that means. Because why would they have to anoint their shield with oil? First of all, if you're a Roman soldier, you're going into battle with a lot of gear, so you can't afford a metal shield. So they learned over time, almost like a baseball glove, if you played Little League or you helped your someone, they would get a glove. You had to oil it, right, to soften it up. 
So you soften up the shield is made with leather on it, but it's got to stay oiled because then you're going to soak it in water so that when the fiery dart comes, it doesn't have a chance. But if there's no oil and there's no water, you don't have a shield because that it's going to light your shield on fire. Who's the oil? Who's the water? The word of God. Oh, wow. I think we have to say that the shield of America will not be taken away. The anointing on the shield of America, which was founded as a nation to spread the gospel. It was religious freedom, and we have more than anybody else. Now we get pigeonholed behind. Don't get behind one certain person who's running. Politicians aren't the answer. Jesus is the answer. But you still have to take a stand in the culture. Well, I'm already working two jobs. Okay, well, then maybe you're not a candidate. But there's a lot of people who might be willing to be candidates, and we're going to just try to help, help it be easier to do that. All right, this is where we're going to end. Here, we just said it, right? The shield has to be oiled up with the Holy Spirit in combination with the water of the Word that cleanses us. So what a great way to live your life. That every day you're oiling your shield of faith that's going out in front of you because that's what goes first, is your faith is what goes first. And then the water of the word stops the fiery darts of the devil. So when you're in that conference room in New York City at 9 o'clock in the morning and three people are tearing into you, you got the peace of God. I'm just oiled up and those fiery darts, out, like a match, out. You don't have that much power over me. I got the spirit of God in me. I got the truth of the word. That's not arrogant. That's keeping a clear head in the middle of a tough situation. You'll make the best decision. And a legal decision. Let's have to throw that in because I saw a couple of times when they would ask me to do things illegal. Well, it's just a gray area. <laughs> That'll be another day's sermon. So the Holy Spirit is like a shield of faith in front of us. He's the oil. And then on the other side is the water. And let's stand. What I wanted you to think about was the activity here can be somewhat related, not, not exclusively related, but if you want to think about two different ways to pray, you could think that the oil of the Holy Spirit is what's alerting us. It's this Vertical relationship that we have with God. We give him praise, but he also speaks back to us. When we pray, we expect him to answer. So the Holy Spirit is like the communication and the strategy side, just like that, not the only way to look at it. And the water of the word is your foundation that you can judge everything by because it's memorized in your heart, right? It, you never know when you're going to face a battle so, boy, I wish I would have read the Bible this morning. It would have really helped me. No, just keep reading the Bible. Just keep getting it in you because you never know what, what you're going to need and when you're going to need it. But, boy, if you've got a deposit of the word, you can make some withdrawals. No deposit. Oh, boy. So the word of God acts as my prayer for the action. What do I actually do? I know the strategy, but now how do I execute that strategy? So it says, from Issachar, men who understood the times and knew what Israel should do. First Chronicles 12, 32. I will help make, you make the linkage between the apostolic and the prophetic. That's the way this works. The foundation of the church is built on the apostles and the prophets. So every morning when we wake up, just say, Lord, I want you to awaken my spirit, to oil me up in the morning, that my shield of faith will be oiled up in the morning, that the truth of the word of God, that water of the word that will quench the fiery darts of the enemy is going to be ready every day. I'm not going to be like the ten virgins who forgot to get their oil. I'm going to be oiled up. I heard a preacher say one time, you're going to have so much oil on you, you're going to be like a grease pig at the county fair. Every time they try to catch you, you're going to squeeze right out, poof, and you just take right off. <laughs> yeah, it's a good picture. Because you need the grounding in the word, but you need the, the real-time access of the Spirit of God on the inside of you. And I talk about Sully a lot, if you know that movie. He only had 208 seconds from the time the birds hit the plane until they were on the Hudson River. It's just a little over three minutes. He didn't have to cognate 
and grab the book and figure out what steps to take. He just acted out of his impulse. He was fluent. He knew. Nobody had ever practiced for this before. Nobody knew what to do. He just started taking steps. Something kicked in and just started taking steps. All the people lived. He was the last one off. 155 people lived. This is, this is a picture of how God wants us to live every day. And look, you know, one of the things that you'll see is that you're going to make some mistakes. So be quick to apologize to people. And, and they like that when you come to them and say, I'm really sorry about the way that conversation went down. I feel like I was a little too disrespectful. That's not who I want to be. I'm trying to aim higher. Would you forgive me? I think they're going to say, no, I hope you burn. <laughs> Call the deliverance team on that one. So my, my final piece is just oil your shield and your connection with the Holy Spirit. Saturate your shield with the word of God and then live your life where you will quench all the fiery darts of the enemy. So can you lift your hands? And we thank you that you have revealed to us the mysteries of the kingdom, that we're not wrestling against flesh and blood, that our shield of faith goes before us, but we can oil that shield. We can saturate that shield in water so that it will not burn, that we can move forward with confidence. That's what faith is. Faith is moving forward with confidence, not running. There's no weapon, there's no piece of armor that protects me if I flee from the enemy. And we say America is at play right now. It's, it's going in the wrong direction, and you have the answers, but we need a translation for 2023 on how to put this to work so that we can see a shift and a revival and, and young people being spared from the evil that's being done to them, and that parents, too, Lord, would wake up and recognize this amazing privilege that they have to steward the lives of their children. We don't want to be judgmental, legalistic people. We want to have the empathy and compassion that you had when you were here, but we also have to put our foot down and say, thus far and no more. This thing is going to reverse, not by my power, but by the name and the authority of Jesus, Lord. Let it be so in the Somerset Hills, in Jesus' name. Amen. That's my prayer for today. So we have a lot of people on the prayer ministry team that will be up here to pray for you. Maybe something got stirred. Maybe you don't know the Lord and you would like to learn more about this. We'll pray with you. We'll, we'll equip you. We'll give you Bibles. There's no fellowship today. If you want a prayer, please come up that aisle right there. And we'll have prayer ministers across the front. Have an awesome day. We love you.